Okay. Um, so this is Calc 1, uh, working with integrals now. And uh, we thought of the integral first as kind of the inverse of the derivative. It's the antiderivative, right? Now we're kind of going to connect the, the integral to area, uh, the area problem, area underneath the curve. Okay. So in order to tackle this issue, we need to um, work a little bit with sigma notation, make sure everybody's on board there. Um, in particular, it's just a, a shorthand way of writing a very long sum of things. So for instance, this uh, symbol means I'm going to plug in 1 in for i, and I get a sub 1. Then I put a plus symbol, and then I plug in 2 for i, and I get a sub 2 and then put a plus. Then I plug in 3 for i, I a sub 3. And you keep on doing that all the way up to this n. So the one before it would be plus a sub n minus 1. That's the one prior to n. And then the last one would be a sub n. Okay. Um, the book will give you some practice exercises in case you've not seen this stuff before. Um, if you want to get good at this stuff, sometimes uh, a discrete math class is what you need, but sometimes not. It depends on how the school teaches that class. Anyways, here um, we're inputting 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 4. Okay, so we get 1 all over 0 squared plus 1 is 1, plus 1 all over 1 squared is 1, plus 1 is 2, plus 1 all over... So, you, you know, you can notate the exact values of k underneath if you need to. Um, here's k. I'm putting 2 in for k here. So 1 all over 4 plus 1 is 5. And then I'm adding k equal 3. So 1 all over uh, 9 plus 1 is 10. And then k equals 4. Um, 1 all over 16 plus 1 is 17. Okay. So it's just a shorthand way of writing an expression like this. Um, there's particular formulas that the book will use, and they kind of assume somehow you know these formulas. So um, there's summation formulas. Again, if you took a discrete math class, I would hope that you would encounter these guys. But, uh, it's going from i equals 1 to n of c, and so what does that equal? Well, you can think of it as a c plus c plus dot 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 all the way up to c, and there's n of them, and then you could literally just factor a c out of it, and you get 1 plus 1 plus all the way up to n of those, so there's n ones here, so um, that'll equal c times n, okay? So this thing equals c times n. Um, you can, then, this, this formula is pretty intuitive. The other one's not so much. Um, but if you did, you played around with uh, these formulas after a while, you would see the patterns. In particular here, this is n times n plus 1 all over 2. And usually in a discrete math class, you prove all these using induction. Um, the sum of i squared from i equals 1 to n is going to be n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. And then um, 4 is just really the square of this one. So the sum of i squared from i equals 1 to n. Whoops, this should have been i squared. Sorry. The sum of i cubed is kind of the square of that formula. So this thing squared would be n squared times n plus 1 squared all over 4. So at least for these two, they're, they're related. Um, generally, if you do a lot of math in, in certain areas, you'll, you'll know this formula. This one, not so much. You usually have to look it up. Um, but this one is just the square of this one, so that one's pretty easy. And then this one's intuitive. It's one of those things you just think about for a while, and oh yeah, it's just c times n. All right, so um, uh, other things we want uh, for our journey here. Um, because we're dealing with finite sums, you can factor out constants. Uh, later on in calculus, you'll be dealing with uh, infinite series, and you won't be able to, to necessarily do this trick, but if the sum is finite, um, you can, you can uh, factor out 
uh, any GCFs, any greatest common factors. Um, uh, also then, if the sum is finite, you can break up uh, sums or, or uh, differences into uh, their own individual sums, right? So this would be the sum of a sub i plus or minus the sum of b sub i for the corresponding uh, limits from i equals 1 to m, okay? Um, the formula, one formula that we're really going to be uh, needing for our work is the, um, G, the arithmetic sum formula. Um, so if, uh, we'll be working with uh, intervals and then needing a formula for the points inside this interval. So maybe I'm going from like one to five and I'm, I'm looking at a sequence of numbers built by adding something in every single time. So uh, let's say I'm going one, then two. Uh, well, that's too easy, right? So one, then um, I don't know. Uh, you could form these things by by looking at this change in x thing, which would be the difference between this endpoint and this endpoint. So five minus one all over the number of intervals that you want. So let's say I want uh, three and no, let's say uh, uh, four intervals. Okay. So if, well, that's not going to be nice. So let's do uh, uh, nine intervals. Okay, that'd be kind of crazy, but so the change in x would be four ninths. So the sequence is going to be one and then one plus four ninths and then um, one plus four ninths plus four ninths all the way up to five, right? So uh, one is the same as nine ninths and then the next point would be 13 ninths and then we would have 17 ninths and then we would have um, 21 ninths, and then add in another four ninths, and we get up to um, 25 ninths. Yeah, I'm not going to have enough room, right? Um, then 29 uh, ninths, and then um, uh, 33 ninths, uh, all the way up to 45 ninths. So basically, you want a formula for the points inside that interval. So again, let, let me write out the, the sort of sequence that we're looking for a formula for. 9 ninths, 13 ninths, 17 ninths, 21 ninths, 25 ninths, um, 29 ninths, 33 ninths, 37 ninths, 41 ninths, and then 45 ninths, right? So this is one and this endpoint is five. So um, we split the interval into nine uh, wedges. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But I want a formula to produce these points, right? So the formula is always going to be a sub i formula equals um, a sub one plus i minus one times the, the difference between two consecutive terms. And the difference is always just going to be this change in x thing here. So the formula will be a sub one plus i minus one um, times four ninths. Okay. And uh, note if you put in um, a sub one, or you put in one for i, uh, uh, you're just going to get um, a sub 1 is 1 plus 1 minus 1 times 4 ninths and obviously you get 1 there because this will be 0. a sub 2 will be 1 plus um, 2 minus 1 times 4 ninths and of course that's just 1 plus 4 ninths which is 13 ninths so you get the second term here. Um, one issue is that sometimes we want to start not at this 9 ninths, but rather at 13 ninths. So in that case, you can just uh, um, move this formula over. So we'll have this arithmetic formula, or if we want to start with the next term in line, a sub i will equal um, a sub 1 plus, uh, 
So how, how does this work? Plus, um, or, sorry, um, plus just plain old i times uh, d. Right? Um, so in that case, your starting point a sub one will be. Um, so so maybe we should call this something else like a sub zero, right? So a sub one will be um, assuming a sub zero is one, one plus uh, one times uh, the four ninths. So you would begin at thirteen ninths, right, with a sub one, the first term. But uh, what what this what this would be is basically just uh, a sub i, and there's another way of writing this which maybe um, is a little more intuitive, a sub i equals, um, you start at that a sub 1 again, but then you, you add in uh, that d value, and then you can continue using that formula that we had before. But what this will devolve into is just a sub i equals a sub 1 plus d minus d, so that's just i times d. Okay, so um, anyways, that's, that's kind of neither here nor there, I guess. Um, but, you know, these, these arithmetic formulas that, that they supposedly teach you at the end of college algebra, you use them to, as generators for the points in an interval. Okay. So we're going to need that encoded into our brain there coming up. And uh, hopefully it'll be more obvious. I'm, I'm a little sketchy on this one formula, but once we get into the context, hopefully it'll become, you know, more, uh, the motivation will be there and, and the mechanics will sort of fall into place. Anyways, let's look at 17 for a second. So we're um, expected to evaluate this thing and put it in terms of n, or, or just figure out what it is, rather, not in terms of n. So what you don't want to do is really literally um, uh, expand it and then add them all up with your calculator. You don't want to do that. You want to use the formulas from the from the previous page that we introduced. So this will be the sum of uh, i squared minus 2i plus 1. And then we can split up this sum, because it's finite, into the sum of i squared um, plus the sum of negative 2i plus the sum of 1. And then we can go ahead and say, all right, the sum of i squared is uh, one of our formulas. So that was like n times n, n, uh, times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Um, and, and then we want to remember to evaluate this thing kind of from 1 to uh, 20. So we're going to let n equal 20 here. Um, and then plus this thing, which is really, uh, you can factor out the constant, right? So I could write it minus 2 times the sum of i. Um, and then finally, plus the sum of 1 is just going to be uh, whatever n is. And so n is going to be 20. So I just write it like that um, to remind myself to evaluate it. Uh, this is my own personal notation, so don't do that. But uh, Plugging in 20 here, what do you get? 20 times 21 times uh, 41 all over 6 uh, minus 2 times the sum formula for that was n times n plus 1 over 2. So let, let's put the 20 in there. It was 20 times 20 plus 1 is 21 all over 2. And then plus plugging 20 in for n there, we get 20. Okay, so you shouldn't really even write it like that. You should just jump to this position here using the formulas. Um, then, uh, you know, we want to, to hopefully multiply this all out. Obviously, the twos will cancel. And if you put it in your calculator, you get 2,470. So um, using the formulas to evaluate these sums. Okay. okay, so now we want to think about area underneath curves. We've, we've uh, accumulated some some, some uh, 
some mechanics that are going to help us do this. Um, so this is section three, uh, finding area of a plane region, a region in the plane, maybe we should say it that way. Um, the book wants us to use left and right hand endpoints and the given number of rectangles to find an approximation of the area between the curve and the x-axis. So um, we're going to have a left hand endpoint formula and a right hand endpoint formula. And again, these come from that that's arithmetic formula that I gave you before. Okay, so for right endpoints, or sorry, left endpoints, um, I could call down little m sub i, that equals a um, plus i minus 1 times the d value, but the d value is going to be given by change in x, which is b minus a over n. And then the right endpoint formula, um, we'll call big M sub i, that's going to be um, a plus just i times uh, this, this factor, uh, b minus a all over m. Okay. So maybe it's not clear what the b minus a's and, and stuff like that are. So let's, let's actually look now at, at this problem. Um, so this is problem 25 in the book. We have f of x equals 2x plus 5 on the interval from 0 to 2. And we want to approximate with four rectangles. Okay. So um, we can actually draw this thing uh, relatively easily. Uh, this is my A and this is my B. Okay. So these are the, the endpoints of the interval I'm working with. Um, so I start at zero, the function value at zero is five, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and then at two, so I'll give myself a little bit of room, um, I have nine, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. And then I need um, four rectangles, okay, so our change in x value um, is going to be b minus a all over 4. So literally it's b minus a all over n, but in this context it's 2 minus 0 all over 4, which is 1 half. Okay? So I'm going, uh, my sequence uh, for the uh, points in my interval, it's going to go 0, and then 0 plus 1 half, and then 1 half plus 1 half, and then 1 plus 1 half, and then 1 plus 1 half plus another 1 half right there, okay? So it's going to be 1 half, and then 1, and then 3 halves, and then 2. Uh, so uh, the corresponding coordinates above these points, which you don't necessarily need to even do, but just for the sake of uh, instruction, uh, 1 half times 2 is 1, plus 5 is going to give me 6. Um, 1 times 2 is 2 plus 5 is going to give me 7, and then 8, and then 9, right? So we're trying to approximate the area underneath that curve. And uh, we want to do it using left uh, endpoints and right endpoints. So what does that mean? That means um, in, in the first case we'll do, I guess, uh, left endpoints. So you can imagine what we're trying to do is figure out the area of this rectangle and then this rectangle and then this rectangle where the heights of the rectangle are dependent on the left endpoint of the particular interval it's in. So the height of this rectangle here is dependent on this point. So f of 0 tells me the height of that particular rectangle. Right? And then if we add up all these rectangles, we'll get an approximation for the area underneath this curve, right? So a sub 1, if we're uh, initially working with um, left endpoints, a sub 1 will equal f of 0 times change in x, where f of 0 is going to be um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then our change in x value is just one half. 
right? And then the second rectangle will be f of 1 half times um, change in x, which will be 6 times 1 half. Then a sub 3 will be um, f of 1 times change in x, which will be 7 times 1 half. And then a sub 4 will be f of 3 halves times change in x, which will be 8 times 1 half. Okay. So we'll get, um, you know, uh, 7 plus 8 is 15, plus another 5 is 20, 26 over 2. So the sum of these rectangles is uh, approximately, well, it's equal to 13, apparently. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so in general here in the future, we're going to be dealing with more and more rectangles. So we want to kind of... Uh, generate a nice mechanical formula for this. And that's that's what I'm talking about back here with these left hand and right hand endpoint formulas. Right. So instead of going through this long involved process of uh, picking out you know the particular areas, what we want to do instead is write it as a, a sum. Right. So we're going from i equals 1 to n, so this will be 4, of f of and then we want a formula that generates this sequence of numbers. And what I said earlier is we have these formulas for generating these sequence. They're arithmetic sequences. And they're, they're sitting right here. So for the left end point, I'm using the formula a plus i minus 1. So our a value here is 0 plus um, i minus 1. So you just keep that the same, i minus 1 times uh, b minus a over n, which is just change in x. Nice times uh, change in x, which is 1 half. Okay. And then um, times, you know, each, each one we have a change in x involved. So we have to multiply it again by change in x, which is 1 half. Okay. Um, we can clean up that sum, and we have the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of f of um, this business, right? So it would be 1 half i minus 1 half, or if you'd rather just i minus 1 all over 2, and then times 1 half. And then if you plug in your values, you should get uh, this plus this plus this plus this. So let's just verify that. Um, plugging in uh, i equals 1, I'll have a 1 minus 1, which is 0 all over 2. So I have f of 0 times 1 half. And then plus, if I plug 2 in there, I get 2 minus 1, which is 1, all over 2. So I have f of 1 half times 1 half. If I plug 3 in there, 3 minus 1 is 2, all over 2, that's 1. So f of 1 times 1 half. And magically, what's happening is I, I get these values, right? I'm just getting all of these uh, written out. Okay, so if you just uh, have faith in these formulas, uh, you can sort of uh, uh, bypass the, this uh, this work here and just uh, go straight to the horse's mouth, so to speak. So this would be f of 4 minus 1 is 3 all over 2 times uh, 1 half. Okay. And of course I found that was 13. Okay, so that was the left-hand endpoint. The right-hand endpoint then, uh, if we use now um, this point for the heights of our rectangles, you'll get these rectangles. I sort of did it in yellow. That's not a good idea. Let's put it in green. Okay, so there's uh, this rectangle and then this rectangle. And you see the rectangles this time um, are above the, the curve because the curve is increasing. That's going to be the, the result. Okay. So... Um, I should get a value which is bigger than the value I got with the um, left-hand endpoints for the areas, because now I'm figuring out these as my a sub i's, right? Okay, so um, in that case, in this case, I'm just going to go directly to my summation formula and work with that directly. So I'll have the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of f of this time 0 plus i times 1 half. Uh, times one half. 
Okay, so that's just the right-hand endpoint formula. And using that, the area of this first rectangle should be f of 1 half, the height of the rectangle, times um, this change in x. Okay. So if you plug in 1, we should get f of 1 half. So let's see if we get it. If I plug in uh, 1 for i, I get 0 plus 1 times 1 half, which of course is just going to be f of 1 half. But let's rewrite the summation a little bit first, right? So it's f of i over 2 times 1 half, from i equals 1 to 4. Okay. So I'm getting what? I'm getting um, the, the uh, first one, when I plug in 1, I get f of 1 half times 1 half plus uh, plug in 2 uh, uh, for i, so I get f of 1 uh, times 1 half. And it's basically just this thing shifted over, right? So I'm getting this one plus this one plus this one, and then I, I'll need f of 2 for the last rectangle. Okay. So f of 1 plus um, when I plug in 3, I'll get f of 3 halves times 1 half, and then plus when I plug in 4, I'll get f of 2 times 1 half. Okay. And uh, we could evaluate that. So f of uh, 1 half is 6. Um, f of 1 is 7. f of 3 halves is 8. And f of 2 is, uh, what the heck is f of 2? Sorry, 9. <laughs> OK. Uh, so this is 15. 31, uh, 40 halves, um, which doesn't sound right. Uh, let me think that again. So 15, 21, 30 halves, which is 15. So if you look back at the picture, the, the green rectangles, the bigger rectangles, should be above the actual. So again, what are we trying to do? We're actually trying to find the area underneath that diagonal curve right there. So I'm really looking for this area here. Right? And what I'm doing is kind of approximating it by using the area of the pink rectangles, was, which was below that area, and then um, or the, the area of the green rectangles, which was above that area. And so um, we s speculate that the actual area underneath the curve is between this, this kind of upper sum and this lower sum. Right. And uh, that's kind of the heart of all of this, uh, all of this area underneath the curve business. We're trying to identify upper sum and a lower sum, and our sum will be somewhere in between those two. Okay. But uh, here in the beginning, that, that's the idea: um, left-hand endpoint, right-hand right endpoint, um, and then then we uh, kind of generalize it from there. So, uh, how do I generalize this idea? Well. One way to generalize it would be to use midpoints. Um, so uh, we would probably want some sort of midpoint formula. Let's see if I have that laying around. Probably not, right? Well, the, the midpoint formula, um, so what are you doing? You're, you're not starting at a sub 1 anymore. So our formula a sub i, let's do a midpoint formula, a sub i is going to be a sub 1 plus 1 half of the distance moved, right? So it would be the, the, uh, um, the change in x all over 2. Right, uh, times um, uh, uh, i. Right, so I believe that would give us uh, midpoints. But let's look at um, a midpoint version while, while we're at it. So using the midpoint rule. So there's a variation on this same left-hand endpoints, right-hand endpoints, midpoints. You could do that too, right, for approximations. Um, so let's try 61. We have f of x equals x squared plus 3. I want to go from 0 to 2, and I want my uh, number of rectangles to be 4. Right? 
So I'm going from 0 to 2, and I need a formula that gives me the sequence of values for the midpoints this time. So you start at 0, and then you're going to add in um, b minus a over 4, right? So 2 minus the change in x is going to be uh, 2 minus 0 all over 4, which is 1 half. And of course, we're not going to be moving by one half. We want to move by one half of one half. So that one fourth is really our our moving value. So change in x all over two is what, where it's at for us. So this would be zero plus one fourth, which of course is one fourth. And then from that point on, we want to move by uh, a value of change in x. So we would have 0 plus change in x all over 2 plus another change in x. Okay. So I would say this is the, the general formula for the midpoint. I'm going to claim is uh, a sub i equals a sub 1 plus change in x all over 2 um, plus i minus 1 times change in x. Okay, so um, in this case, it's 0 plus 1 fourth plus a movement of 1 half. Okay, so this is the same as uh, 2 fourths, which would give me 3 fourths. Okay, so um, my first midpoint uh, and, you know, is, is 1 fourth. So if this is 1 half, this is 1, this is 3 halves. My first point here is one fourth, and then I want the midpoint of this interval from one half to one, so that is obviously three fourths, and then I'm hoping to get to here three four five fourths. Okay, so hopefully using this formula, this was i equals one, this is i equals two, i equals three. Let's see if it works now. So I get. Um, a sub 3 equals a sub 1, which was 0, plus change in x over 2, which is turning out to be 1 fourth, plus change in x times uh, 3 minus 1 times change in x, which is going to be 1 fourth plus 2 times 1 fourth, which is 1 fourth plus uh, 1 half, uh, which is 2 fourths, which is going to be equal to um, three-fourths again. Well, what did I do wrong? So this is going to be equal to two. Um, oh, change in x is, is one-half. So uh, one-fourth plus uh, one, which is the same as four-fourths, which is equal to five-fourths. Okay, so yeah, that, that's going to be your midpoint formula. So um, in practice, then, uh, our summation will go from i equals 1 to, to 4 of f of this thing. Um, so it, in our case, it's 0 plus uh, change in x over 2 would be 1 fourth plus i minus 1 times 1 half times our change in x value, which is 1 half. So this will end up equaling the sum from i equals 1 to 4 of f of um, 1 fourth plus i minus 1 over 2 times 1 half, which will end up equaling, um, let's see, so f of, if I plug in 1, I'll get 1 fourth times 1 half, plus f of, if I plug in 2, I'll get um, one fourth plus one half, which is one fourth plus two fourths, which is three fourths times one half, and then plus f of, so I plug in three, I get one fourth plus um, one, so one fourth plus four fourths is five fourths times one half, and then finally plugging in four, I get f of. Um, if a 4 minus 1, so 3 halves, 1 fourth plus 3 halves is the same as 1 fourth plus 6 halves, which is 7, so 1 fourth plus 7, uh, 6 fourths, which is 7 fourths times 1 half. And uh, certainly this, this sequence, are this, this represents the midpoints of these intervals. So 0 to 1 half, I need the midpoint of that. 
for the height of my uh, rectangle, that would be at one fourth, then three fourths and five fourths, six, seven fourths right here for the last one. Okay. And then you just plug all of these values into the function. And I'm getting uh, 8.625 as an approximation for my area. Okay, so I, I, again, um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to figure out the area underneath the curve. And what I'm kind of telling you is that we can do it uh, using uh, left-hand endpoint, right-hand endpoint, and then again, midpoint. So the question becomes, uh, does it matter which point you use in the interval, so long as you use some point in the interval? And it turns out it doesn't matter, okay? So long as the function is uh, continuous and non-negative, uh, we have theorem 5.3. Okay, so theorem 5.3, uh, if f is continuous, and uh, non-negative um, on, on this interval from A to B, then the limit of the, the sum of these areas, which are found by using endpoints, so let's say a small, the smallest value you can find in an interval, and then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the smallest uh, f value, the largest f value you can find in a particular interval. So, uh, for example, if you had this curve like this and you're going from A to B, um, in any particular interval that you pick out, there's going to be kind of a maximum rectangle and a minimum rectangle. So, this corresponds, and I need a little change in X in here as well. Um, this side would correspond to that largest rectangle, which would be right here. And then this side represents to adding up all the smallest rectangles, which would be like right there. Okay. So um, theorem 5.5 says that uh, if f is continuous and non-negative, then these will be the same. And thus by the squeeze theorem, any uh, point you pick in the interval um, will be in between these two guys, and you can essentially say that the limit of the sum of f of any endpoint, or any midpoint, or even a point kind of off to the side there, um, will equal these guys up here. Okay, so that'll equal essentially the area underneath the curve if. Uh, the thing is, the function is well enough behaved. Okay, okay so um, we've kind of uh, generalized the idea a little bit. Um, you know, we started with having doing left hand endpoints or right hand endpoints. Now we're saying we could do any endpoint or any point in a subinterval that we want and create the box off of it. So we could pick like a point here and then use the box there as kind of an approximator for that little strip. Um, right, so, okay, okay. Um, let's, let's get back to kind of just the exercises in the book and what you're going to be looking at. Um, they could be a bit rigorous if you've not, or a bit demanding if you've not worked much with summation notation. Um, anyways, let's, let's use uh, this uh, sort of uh, factoid to find the area of the region underneath the curve. So in particular, let's look at number 47. Um, y equals x squared plus 2 um, from 0 to 1. Okay, so this function is continuous. Um, and, and so we should be able to take the limit of the sum of these things and find the area. And we could use either the left-hand endpoint or right-hand endpoint. And in practice, you're going to probably want to use the right-hand endpoint because the formulas are easier. Okay, so um, I'm going to use the right-hand endpoint and the corresponding formulas. Okay, so uh, the picture, you know, what we're doing, obviously it's a parabola going from 0 to 1. It's starting here at uh, 2 and going to there. Okay, I need the area right there underneath this curve. 
Okay, so I'm using this idea to find that area. So I'm taking the limit of the sum of f of, and I'm using, sorry, there's some fur in my mouth from my cat. Um, so it's f of uh, 0a plus i times change in x, right? So, and, and, uh, so we need the change in x value, which will be 1 minus 0 all over n. So this time we're taking the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity from i equals 1 to n. So we're, we're not telling you what n should be. Okay, we just want to make millions of rectangles, and that'll give us a really, that'll give us the area underneath the curve. Okay, so change in x will be 1 minus 0 all over n, in other words, 1 over n. So my formula for those, those points on the right side will be um, 0 plus i times 1 over n. So in other words, i over n, and then times uh, 1 over n for our change in x. Okay, okay so now I need to uh, input this into here, and I have the limit of the sum of uh, i squared over n squared um, plus 2 times 1 over n. Okay. And then I have uh, the limit of the sum of distributing now. I get i squared all over n cubed plus 2 over n. Okay. And then you're really just thinking about um, finding a formula for this thing here in terms of n and then taking its limit. So uh, remembering the formulas from the beginning of this section, we need a formula for i squared. We can factor out um, the n because this summation is not dependent on n. Um, it's a, a, a function of i. We're putting i's inside of it. So the n can be factored out of the sum, and we'll end up with 1 all over n cubed times the sum of i squared plus 2 times the sum, 2 over n times the sum of 1. Okay. All right, so we have formulas for these summations, right? So this will equal the limit of uh, 1 all over n cubed times the sum of i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6. Um, then the sum of 1 is from i equals 1 to n is just n. So this would be uh, plus 2 over n times n over 1. Okay. And uh, then I have a limit of this thing, so uh, it'll behave, and we're taking an angle to infinity. The limit of this thing will behave like the limit of the, the, the high degree terms of the numerator and denominator, the ratio of those. So the high degree term in the numerator is really just 2n cubed. And then in the denominator, we have 6n cubed, and then plus uh, 2, basically, and n's will divide out. And then this will behave as a constant 2, 6. So the limit of 2, 6 is just 1 third. So you get 1 third plus 2, um, you know, uh, 6 thirds plus 1 thirds gives me 7 thirds. Okie dokie. So awesome. I can figure out the area underneath this curve. This might have been a, a really hard problem back in the day, trying to trying to figure this out. Maybe they'd use rectangles and approximate a, a, a triangle over here, but they probably never really got it until they started worrying about taking limits and doing this infinite process. Okay, that would probably be interesting to study the history of that, right? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, let's look at another one here. So this is 59. Um, I want to find the region bounded by the y-axis. And uh, you have this formula, g of y equals 4y squared minus y cubed. We're going from 1 uh, to y to 3. Okay. So um, let's draw a, a small picture here of what's going on. I don't know if the picture's in the book, but I'm going from 1 to 3. And uh, at 1, 
the corresponding x value four minus one will be uh, three. So one, two, three, get this point here. At three, the corresponding y value, um, you know, uh, nine times four is 36 minus uh, 27. Sounds like nine to me. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I get this guy over here. Um, it's a cubic, so it's probably going something like this. Okay. And I want to know the area underneath that curve from here to here. Okay. So what you do is just kind of uh, think that you're working in um, this direction. Always do like a little running man. He looks like he's a criminal. Let's put a little mask on him. And what he's doing is running in this direction and adding up the area of these rectangles, however you want to form them. Okay. So it's this direction that I'm really moving. You can't literally just put it like this and then add in this direction. It's really this direction you're thinking of. Okay. So anyways, I'm going to be using my um, uh, right-hand endpoints again. So I'm going to right-hand endpoint formula. Um, I'm doing a limit of the, uh, as n goes to infinity, of the sum of these things. And uh, I'm going from i equals 1 to n. Uh, in this case, g of, and I need my change in y this time instead of change in x. Change in y is 3 minus 1 all over n, so 2 over n. And I'm starting at 1, so 1 plus 2 over n i, so 2 i over n. And then I have to multiply it by um, 2 over n for the change in x. Okay. So then just uh, chug it out. So the limit of the series of this thing and put it into there looks like a real headache. So let's get that done. Um, 4 times 1 plus 2i over n squared minus 1 plus 2i over n cubed um, times 2 over n. Um, you can simplify this a little bit and make your life a little less miserable by factoring out a binomial of 1 plus 2i over n squared. So you'll have a factor of 1 plus 2i over n squared. And then on the inside, you have 4 minus this 1 plus 2i all over n times 2 over n. Um, I'm going to go ahead then and uh, simplify this a little bit, and I want to FOIL this guy out. Okay, so I have the limit of the sum of uh, this guy FOILed. So what is that going to be? That's going to be um, 1 plus 2 of these, so uh, 2, 2i two over n, so that would be 4i over n, and then this times this plus 4i squared all over n squared. And then um, this thing, 4 minus 1 of these is 3. And then minus 2i over n. I'm going to distribute this while I'm at it. So I'm up with 3 times 2 over n. So sorry, 6 over n. And then um, minus 4i over n squared. And then I'm going to go ahead and multiply all of this baloney out. Okay. Just for the sake of sanity, I've kind of already done that in my notes. So I'm just going to write it 6 over n plus 20i over n squared plus um, 8i squared over n cubed minus 16i cubed all over n to the fourth. Okay, and then from that point, I can start using my summation formulas to clean this up. So this would be the limit of uh, 
6 over n times the sum i equals 1 uh, to n of 1 plus, so I'm factoring out anything, uh, any n's, any constants, so 20 over n squared times the sum of i plus 8 all over n cubed times the sum of i squared minus 16 all over n to the fourth times the sum of i cubed. Okay. And then invoke your formulas. So this would be the limit of 6 over n times n plus 20 all over n squared times n times n plus 1 all over 2 plus 8 all over n cubed times n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6 minus 16 all over n to the fourth times n squared times n plus 1 squared all over 4. Right, and then take the limit of that thing. So this part is 6. Um, this part we have 20n squared over 2n squared, which will be 10. Um, this guy we have, uh, looks like we have a 16n cubed over 6n cubed. So 16 over 6 is the same as 8 over 3. And then this final guy, um, we have a 16n to the fourth over 4n to the fourth. So that will be minus 4. Okay. So 16 uh, minus 4 is 12, plus 8 thirds. Um, so 36 plus 8 over 3. In other words, 44 thirds. Okay, okay. so this is uh, a very long and drawn out process. Um, what we're hoping here in the next couple sections then is, is to find a way to simplify all of this. And uh, that'll be the fundamental theorem of calculus that will allow us to kind of just uh, use the antiderivatives to do the job. But we still have a little bit of ways to get there. We need to introduce the Riemann sum and generalize uh, this summation formula a little bit more. Okay, so we'll, we'll generalize uh, the widths of the intervals and uh, then we'll go from we'll go from there. Okay, thanks for watching.